in. Is this where the damn drumming and the music kicks in? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, hello, welcome, thanks for joining me. Welcome to this week's episode of On the Pipe Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Tyler Shepardson, and today is Tuesday, August the 23rd, 2022, years after zero. And we got an OTP Tuesday coming right at you, coming in hot. Uh, this was a really good conversation, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Stu joined us. We talked about a plethora of topics, and at the last five minutes, we talked about the race that happened over the weekend. But um, no, it was uh, it was cool to catch up with Stu. Um, it's cool to have you back, have you back and listening. We were gonna do this one live on video, end up having a little bit of technical difficulties, and then just kind of mismatching with schedules. But uh, nevertheless, we're here. You can hear us just like you've always heard us. Um, I do want to say what I'm going to do going forward is FaceTime interviews and do it on video. I'm going to do those on Twitch. So if you are not following us yet on Twitch right now, it is on the pipe gaming. If you search for that on Twitch, it'll pop right up. If you go to the link in our bio on any of our social medias, um, or if you have one of the new OTP stickers, there's a QR code on it. You can just point your camera at that QR code. All of our links pop up. Anyway, nonetheless, uh, you can go to onthepipepodcast.com and find it. But Twitch is a video streaming thing. So um, right now, if you go on Twitch, uh, it's used for video gaming is what a lot of it is. But the tools that they use makes it way easier to do it. So I'm going to do them live on Twitch. After we record them on Twitch, they're going to be sent over to YouTube. So you will be able to view the live videos on YouTube, but you won't be able to view them live. And I don't, I think I might have just said you can view the live videos on YouTube. You can view the videos afterwards on YouTube, but you can only view them live on Twitch. So I think that's what, um, what we're going to do. So if you don't have a Twitch, I don't know if you can watch videos on Twitch without having an account. I'm pretty sure you can watch them, but you can't comment on them without an account. Nevertheless, Twitch is 100% completely free. And so if watching those shows live is something that you'd want to do, um, also we'll be able to have the chat on there as we're talking live. So that way, as something comes up in the conversation, anybody that has any questions, you'll be able to chat or type in the chat what those questions are. We'll be able to ask them real time and hopefully get more people involved in the show. So that is the goal, um, strictly for an ease of use standpoint. Like I said, they will get pushed over to YouTube afterwards. You'll be able to watch them there. And as always, you will always be able to hear the recorded version, just like you're hearing now on your favorite podcast app. I know that kind of makes it easier to throw on when your car, when you're driving or Put on headphones when you're uh, when you're working or whatever. But um, we're gonna do the live shows on Twitch. So if you don't have a Twitch account, you can make one completely free, and um, it would help me a lot if you you follow along because then you'll get updates when we're going live. Um, I'll try to keep you guys informed of that, obviously. But um, if you have an account, you'll be able to comment, ask questions, and, and talk to us as the show goes on. Um, right now, like I said, I think it's on the pipe gaming eventually uh, there's a time limit as soon as that time limit runs out i'm gonna change it to on the pipe podcast um so it will be on the pipe podcast at some point but right now i think it's on the pipe gaming um but yeah that's where we're gonna do the live shows at as always want to let you guys know beta motorcycles is the official manufacturer of on the pipe podcast uh beta motorcycles has been family owned and operated since 1905 they manufacture the finest enduro trials and dual sport motorcycles and are known for their premium quality and rideability beta motorcycles are the best looking bikes on the market period and back it up with their superior performance head over to betausa.com for more information on their available models or to find a dealer near you to get yours Today, don't forget, when you're ordering a bike, you can order it off of Beta's website. You can get your own suspension on it. Now you can even get your own parts put on it. You don't like the handlebars that are on it? 
tell us what bars you want. They'll send it to you with those bars on it. It's pretty crazy. Um, it's also the only dirt bike that I'm aware of that has a warranty. So you can go out and ride your dirt bike, and if something happens, it's warrantied for six months. So check them out. Beta, they're sick bikes. Um, I'm going to be doing some racing on mine. I can't wait. When we put this whole beta deal together, the goal was to go race a bunch of different series, film it, talk about it, do all that stuff. Obviously, hit a deer 65 miles an hour on a street bike, snapped my leg in half. That kind of derailed the first half of my season. Now, we're getting this thing going, baby. You got a titanium rod in here. Been working it out. Been building the muscles back up. Finally got some health insurance. We're going racing second half of the season. So, keep an eye out for that. It's going to be a good time. I can't wait because I love riding my beta motorcycle. Now, I can't wait to ride it slower than everybody else around me with a lot of people going through the woods at the same time. Very excited. Um, This episode, as always, is also brought to you in part by Zach Tussle at Raymond James Financial. Zach is a racer, and he's also a financial advisor that helps his clients win when it comes to retirement and financial planning. But on the racetrack, he'll try to make you lose so he can win because he's fast. A rider. Anyway, if you or someone you know wants to save or invest for the future or is already retired and needs advice for income during retirement, Zach Tussle is always my first recommendation. And also, I might add, the first recommendation of pro riders that you may know. They got Zach handling their money. So if you want your money where a racer is handling it, check out Zach Tussle. Um, you can find out more by Googling Zach Tussle or they have a website, financialadvisorsdenvernc.com. And he has also openly said that if you want to contact him on social media, it goes down in the DMs is what he said, I believe. They made a song about it. It was crazy. Um, but yeah, check out Zach Tussle either on the socials or at financialadvisorsdenvernc.com. Figure out exactly what it is that he can offer, what he can do, and uh, let's get you set up for your financial future. They can start there. A um, couple races this weekend. National Enduro went back to racing. It was a complete rain fest. Stu talks about the, the last test and how much it stormed and stuff. Um, here in the show, so I'm not going to take too much of that thunder away. (laughs) Get it? You know what I mean? Uh, Definitely pun intended on that one. But taking the win over the weekend, it was Grant Baylor that went out there and not only took the win at the Grassman National Enduro, but he took over the points lead. So he won the championship the year before last, right? Stu won it last year? Yeah. So the year before last, um, Grant won his first National Enduro Championship. Now he moves back into the points lead for this season's championship points race. Craig DeLong in that number two spot. And then Trevor Bollinger, old Tebow, grabbing that final podium position with a third place finish. Um, we look down at our Pro 2 class. My buddy and yours, Steel City Men's Clinics, Honda's. Benjamin Nelko grabs the Pro 2 win and furthers his Pro 2 points lead. So he is the Pro 2 full gas sprint enduro champion. And he is, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to talk too early. I don't want to say nothing too early. But um, he might be on his way to a Pro 2 national, national championship. So um, Ben Nelko goes out there, gets it done in the rain, puts the steel back in his life, and grabs that number one spot on that Steel City Men's Clinic Honda. Um, so that was cool. And in the number two spot, our boy, our beta boy, Jonathan Johnson, grabs the number two spot in uh, in that Pro 2 class. And Steve Nicholas will round out the Pro 2 podium. Um, so that's the way that it all shook up. Shout out old johnny johnson on that beta putting the two smoke up there on the box in that number two spot and then uh we look down to our women's pro class women's elite i'm sorry there's only two of them it was a battle between oceania it was a battle between an australian reigning defending two-time national enduro champion and new zealand's own rachel archer so uh, Mackenzie Trigger ends up getting the best of it, grabs the win in the women's elite class. Rachel Archer finishes second in that women's elite class. So that is the way that it panned out there. I, myself, was talking all weekend long over a microphone at the Middies Hair Scrambles. 
It was a very good time. It was very hot on Saturday, very dusty. And then we got some rain overnight, and it turned into perfect conditions on Sunday. Um, they do a, a really great job uh, as far as running running an event and running races. So if you haven't checked out a Mideast, you should probably go check them out. But, um, yeah, I was out there. It was a good time. Had a couple familiar faces coming out and racing with us. Gus Reardon came out. Mason Simmons came out. Um and then a, a big pro class, Tyler Palmer, back racing. Um, so it was cool to, to see everyone out there. But Gus Reardon and Mason Simmons, they both swapped back and forth for quite a bit. Um, Mason led the first, I think, four laps. And then Gus ended up getting the lead and held it down to the checkered flag. So Gus Reardon gets the win in his first Mideast hair scramble. Mason Simmons gets that number two spot. And then... Um, Mike DeLosa will round out the overall podium at the Mideast Hair Scramble. So it was cool to be a part about that. It was cool to, to give an old 10 seconds call. Um, my voice started to fade after like the 49th 10 second call by the end of the weekend. But I was plugging away trying to trying to make it through it. Last time I announced a Mideast race was just a couple months ago, which was my first. It was the public, um, the public debut of my very own 10 seconds call and I overdid it quad day peewee quads. I mean, I was, I was giving it everything I had, like the whole, I was putting my chest into it. And then, uh, by the time the, the bikes came around, which I'm trying to learn more quad stuff. I don't know the quad guys bike stuff gets there. All my friends are there. All my buddies were there. All the people I used to race against were there. These are my people. And then my voice sounds like I'm going through puberty because I blew it all out on uh, on Saturday. So this time, I paced myself. Paced myself throughout the entire weekend. And still, by the time the pro bike race happened, I was losing it. So <laughs> I think it's definitely something that you got to work into. But I don't want to I don't want to give myself too much credit. I don't want to sound like I'm bragging. But, um, I mean, there were some rumors. People were calling me Tyler Tomlin. You know what I mean? I just, nah. I mean, I don't, no, I'm just kidding. No, it was, it was cool. Um, that 10 seconds thing, it is, it's so synonymous with like GNCC and you can hear Rodney's voice. And I can't tell you how many times I walk around my house, just screaming 10 seconds and like doing the whole thing. Like, uh, like Rodney does, um, or like Bruce Buffer announcing UFC fighters. That's a, that's another one too. I, I think I got a mean Bruce Buffer impression. And I got a pretty mean Rodney Tomlin impression. So um, at least you think that until you're on a microphone, there's a bunch of people standing around you and you're doing it for real. And you're not in your house walking around by yourself. You're uh, you're at a racetrack with, with speakers. Like you're talking and people are hearing you. So it's it's cool. It's fun. Um, I'll be on the mic the rest of the season at the Mideast Hair Scrambles. And other than that, I'm still up to something. I can't tell you what I'm up to yet. But I think we're getting close. Um, that being said, I think I'm done with my rambling. I think I think that's all I got to say about that. And we're going to get straight into the show. Thank you guys for being here. Appreciate you coming back for On The Pipe Podcast. I'm so excited that we are on the cusp of racing return, like racing getting back in full. I, I haven't known what to do with myself these past couple weeks. I know National Enduro happened. I I guess for me, because I was working all weekend at announcing that I didn't get to keep up with National Enduro the way that I usually do, but I don't know, man. It's just, like it or not, it just seems like everything revolves or everything turns with the the GNCC world. And so until that first GNCC happens, I feel like we're still on summer break. And I know we're not. I know we're back racing. The ISDE is next week. Um, We're going to try to do some cool stuff for that, but um, excited excited for what's ahead excited to watch team usa win the world trophy team win the junior trophy team win the women's trophy team they go back to back win every single club team that there is or i'm excited team usa all the way uh and then we'll go back gncc racing but until then make sure you give us a follow if you're not already following us but i'm willing to bet that if you're listening to this you probably follow us uh cool thank you appreciate you uh, subscribe wherever you're listening to this at hit that quick little button give us a rating I think some of the things have a rate like Apple Podcasts have a rating if you think we suck let us know if you think we're good hey let us know you know what I mean um, thank you for being here thank you for listening I will see you next week oh I just hit I hit the wrong button
Here's Stu. So joining us now, welcoming in Stuart Baylor Jr. Stu, what's going on tonight, man? How's everything going? Just staying busy, man. Trying to uh, trying to work out all the all the bugs and today's life, and it's been a while. Had a had a crazy hectic last few weeks. Obviously, it's uh, contract time, negotiations going on. Um, a lot of a lot of big changes um, moving forward, and just ended up listing our house and bought a piece of property closer to the track so um yeah it's been wild damn you're coming in coming in hot and heavy big changes how's work been going man what's 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 been going on <laughs> <laughs> just just uh just little shake ups you know I, we've got um just just ideas right now so um nothing's nothing's official i mean there's a lot of insinuation going on and I've had a lot of people call asking what I'm, what my plans are for the future. And right now the plan, the, you know, short term is, is we're going to be racing next year. Um, and I, I don't know, you know, on what, who for anything like that. I, I, I definitely, definitely have talked to everybody and, you know, do the normal shopping around and we'll see, we'll see where we, where we end up, but you never really know. I mean, this is that silly season where everybody, everybody thinks they might know what's going on and might, I, hell, I might've just signed a five year deal saying exactly where I was, or maybe I just told everybody I'm, I'm riding a bull taco or something. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's definitely silly season and it's been extra silly for me. And, just trying to uh, make sure that everything makes sense, and um, you know, still, still, obviously, focused on the remainder of this year, but um, also making sure that we're making the right decisions on on everything for next year and the and the next few years moving, and um, even beyond that, trying to put ourselves, you know, at least my family wise, trying to put ourselves in a in a situation where we've got a future with the sport. You know, aside from just the shoals, I want to I want to be they're at the races. I want to be doing something there and um, I try to put myself in the situation there to, to do more at the races and also putting ourselves closer to the shoals with this new purchase of, uh, of property right down the street or a mile from the track. So not close enough that um, the boys can stagger over to the, to the house, throw um, eggs at your house. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, not not quite that close. We're gonna put up an electric fence for Bob so that <laughs> hopefully he doesn't come over too often. Um, what was that? that uh, what was that? The Squid Games thing? You need a, a giant statue that shoots paintballs or something that's motion activated. <laughs> Jade would have a heyday if I told her she could do that. <laughs> Absolute heyday. No warning or anything. You get caught yeah. walking around, you just start getting paintballs flying at you. <laughs> Write that down, uh, man. We might be on some. <laughs> I honestly, I think that would be a great gate protection. <laughs> You'd only do well, it once. <laughs> yeah, he would. He, actually, you know, this we're talking about Bub's talk. He's, <laughs> he's the type to do something stupid three or four times. Man, I saw him. Uh, he was up riding riding at, with at the Aussie compound today. Yeah, yeah. They shot out this morning and and went up there. And I guess I've been working him working him over too much, so he. He wanted to go ride with people that he that he thought was gonna go maybe slower and take it easy on him, and they worked him over even worse. It sounds like. So, yeah. <laughs> Have you been up there to ride at I, all yet? No, I haven't. I, I'm so we're so wide open at the shoals. Like I, Josh has invited me up a few times, and it it just it's been it's been rough timing. Like here at the track, like up leading up to Loretta's, we were we were pretty slammed, and then since then. Um, with all the stuff going on around the house and how sell how trying to sell the house and then <clears throat> purchasing this new property, we've been so tied up that I, I haven't had time for anything. So it's been a bit of a bit of a rough patch. But I I want to I want to get up there. It looks like they have that place dialed in. They got uh they got Josh as the track bitch. It looks like they got him working hard, <laughs> from what I can tell. So. Um, I think he's figuring out how the equipment runs. It looks like. 
<laughs> well, Will uh, Will Reardon, he's been the the maintenance guy down there. He's, he's been recovering, but now I think they're switching roles. I think Josh might be on prepping duty. Sounds like. <laughs> yeah, see, he he seems to be the the full time videographer, if nothing else. So, <laughs> um, yeah, 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 that looks like they've definitely got a killer set up, and that enduro cross coming in, like definitely, definitely want to go check that place out. I haven't been there since. Oh, uh, it's it's been probably 10 years back when it was JGR and um, we went out there a few times with KTM and the place is definitely a really, really cool place. So need to, need to make it up there. Just haven't, like I said, haven't had the time here lately. Yeah. It's a, it's a fun little gem and they've definitely done a lot of work to it, but obviously you living and working at a track, I know that there's a lot that comes up with that, but earlier you were talking about silly season and we kind of started right into it. And I, I guess, due to all sorts of different things we can't go too far into depth but on the whole looking across the board looking across everybody silly season this year going into next year seems sillier than it's ever been i think the past few years we really haven't seen too many big shakeups, and i think next year might be the year that we see the most people in the pro class on different colors. Do you remember a time that there was this much swapping or at least this much rumors of swapping going around? No, um, I, I've never, never seen this much madness. We're talking um, about almost all of the XC1 class and yeah, a lot I of XC2 guys. 70%, like 70% of XC1 has, has done something crazy or creative this year. Um, and you know at least at least hearsay obviously you never really know until until you know but um at this point from what i'm hearing like there's going to be a lot of big shakeups and uh it, it's good like it's good for the series it's good for the sport it's good for the following more than anything because the more people the more eyes watching the more everybody gets that exposure and all ships rise with the tide so you know i mean i know there's going to be some ruffled feathers some upset fans some upset sponsors some upset teams some upset managers but at the end of the day it's going to be better for every single one of the people that i just listed um if you're a sponsor of the sport yeah you might have lost your guy he might have gone to another team but there's going to be more eyes on whoever it is um, that's taking his spot. There's going to be more eyes on your team, your your favorite rider, your for, your favorite bike, whatever it may be. There's going to be more eyes in general next year to watch, especially early in the season. I think to watch all of these changes, especially that round one. You know, what are these guys looking like? Obviously, the announcements will be made before then. The shakeups will start, but then people question, yeah. "Hey, is this guy?" is this going to be a Jason Anderson where he lines up on a Cowie and now he's the man? Or is this going to be a Tomac where he's on a Yamaha and now he's the man? Like, um, you know, certain bikes do definitely fit other riders and, and certain programs and teams also. Like I, I mean, I think a bike, a bike can definitely mesh with a rider, but I think the team more so than anything is the, as the biggest thing that that riders either work well with or don't and everybody's got their own thing like my brother is not the type that i am like he wants he wants that team atmosphere and he wants somebody to do it for him and a lot of riders are like that like he doesn't want to have to talk to the sponsors he wants to show up and do his job and go home and um some guys are are the opposite you know like i i personally i like bullshitting with my sponsors like i i like to be able to pick up the phone and and talk to these guys um i do i do little things differently and i need a team that is going to be kind of a little bit looser a little more laid back that i can bs with because i'm hard on people and i'm also i i joke with people a lot and if they can't take it then i can't have hard feelings (laughs) No, so. and, yeah, and it's it's crazy too because you, you tie it to Supercross. I mean, you got guys like Cooper Webb who stunk all those years on a Yamaha, moves to KTM, wins championship first year, and then wins another championship. 
But I guess the like you were saying, the team aspect plays a big part of it, especially in off road, just because it is like you're changing families. Yeah, I mean you you've got to have like to have a to have a good program. Um, I feel like there's three things that have to be into play. Um, good, good suspension. Trust in your team and a mechanic that's like family. And if you've got those three things, like you're going to be unstoppable. But hmm. there's. The, you know, there there's a different type of trust from person to person. I talk a lot. You may not trust me because I talk too much. The next person might trust me a ton because he might be a talker as well. I, I mean, I you know that there's the different types of people that just mesh with certain people. Um, so, you know, you've got to find that 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 mesh um, with with the people that you're working with, and you have to be open as well. Like. Um, and that's kind of where that trust comes in with the team. Like I see a lot of guys, a lot of guys that do this. And this has probably been the, the one thing that's helped me in my career is I never do this. Um, if there's something that I got a problem with, they don't have to guess and they're not going to hear it secondhand. Nine times out of 10, <laughs> they're going to be the first one to hear it because I'm going to come in and I'm going to tell them right on the spot. And, you know, that's where, like, for me to have a team, I got to have guys that I'm buddies with that I can, you know, I can bust their balls after the race, whatever, talk a little crap and they not get offended. But I also wanted in return. I like, like, come on, tell me I'm, tell me I'm being a dumbass. Tell me that that ain't going to work. Like, let's try it, but tell me it's not going to work before we try it. Let's, you know, let's like, that's, that's where like my mechanic, Corey McDonald, um, he and I can sit there and, and just bust on each other all day long. We literally flip quarters before races on what tires we're running. People ask me about a 53. Why did you line up on that 53? And I, you know, the, the professional answer answer is, oh, we tested it and I was faster on it and it looked good for these conditions. What really happened was we had this tire sitting there that nobody had run all year and I hated the 81 and it was too hard packed for the 33 and Corey said you want to try it and i said hell i don't know he said all right we'll flip a quarter on it and we flipped a quarter on it so you know <laughs> that's that's the type of team that i mesh with like kind of loose laid back um but you know obviously we get our work done we trust each other um but yeah and then you know the on the on the opposite side i i you know I just just from what i see i feel like some of the other guys are a little more uptight and like precise i i mean ben's ben's a super nice dude but i feel like he's he's very uh direct and um if if he's if he's making a decision it's very calculated so he's going to want to work with somebody who is equally as calculated um yeah they're going to have their fun they got to have a good relationship between a mechanic and rider but um a lot different than let's say myself and Corey. so you know, that's, that's where you see your biggest, like, I, I personally believe that that's where you're going to see your biggest changes is who's going to fit with their team the best. And you'll see come round three, like round one. Yeah. Everybody's still shaking off a new by round three. We're going to figure out who hates who and who's working well. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got your childhood best friend wrenching for you. You guys are packing up vans, loading them in trailers. So, sounds like you found your spot, man. Y'all off for ten years. That's what I just heard. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, man. So. And going back to, I guess now, especially this year, I guess if you don't walk in and tell them directly to their face, they're gonna come back in on on Wednesday and say, "Hey, man, I heard you say on this podcast that." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Normally, like I said, nine times out of ten, they're they're gonna hear it from me first, and if it if it didn't come from me. And it's a problem. Usually I still hear about it and I usually have to track down the problem. We had a little bit of that going on this week where just rumors, you know, people talking, um, talking rumors that about the silly season. And, you know, when, when, when you get talking the rumors, um, about the silly season, it's not necessarily that it's a problem. The problem is whoever leaked it first. 
and um that's the you know that's the biggest thing that i see like who, wait what's who the what's leaking? what's the problem what are you what are you describing as the problem of, so, of who leaked it so the problem that comes back is <laughs> let's say that you're talking to two sponsors mm. and somebody finds out well now you've got what usually happens is a sponsor's going to put you on a deadline and say hey you got to sign this now um or they both get pissed off and walk away. Um, but, it, you know, it's the name of the game. I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, it's a little bit different than the, than the business world. I mean, in the business world, you know that if you're a contractor and they're putting in a Walmart, that you're bidding against 20 other contractors. Um, and, and you know that. And they know that. And it's open. And it sucks, but sometimes you're going to get it, sometimes you're not. But it's business. And the dirt bike world, it is um, a, a, a big world feel, but it's really a small industry at the top. So um, a lot of these guys are buddies, tight, whatever. Um, and when rumors get flying, a lot of times information is misspread. And a typical game of telephone, it comes back around. And by the time I hear it, it's not at all what's happening or what's going on. And you got to find the source. Where did it leak? Who started it and what's going on? Why has this become such a big problem? And that's uh, that's the worst part of the silly season is is me, that side of it. Let me tell you and, something. As a media person, <laughs> this all resonates with, with what you're saying. And that's exactly why, like, you hear some things and then you really got to vet that information. You got to figure out where it can, exactly like you were saying. Who leaked it? Where did this come from? Did it come from the rider side? Did it come from the manufacturer's side? Which which side did it come from? Which camp did it come from? And this is uh this is our fifth year of OTP now. Just hit five years, and kind of kind of learning it as I go. So we've been talking about silly season the past couple weeks on the show, and two weeks ago I said some of the stuff that I was hearing, and the cool part about that was that the stuff that it wasn't got you right. Some more information. Do what? it got you some more information exactly (laughs) i mean your job is literally your job is literally to do the things that that i'm like oh my gosh we can't do that um so so no like you you have to spill it but like it's like the whole brennan shoefield showfield whatever deal with with deegan's like same thing i don't like i'm not i feel like i'm educated in that situation like I've I've talked to I've talked to some of the Yamaha guys over there, like just kind of joking with them about stuff, like, and and I've talked to everybody about it, and I still feel like I'm completely uneducated on the situation because every time you read something or hear something else, it's a completely different story. Like the story, not one story has lined up from one guy to the next, like you're on one side or the other side and then there's this new third side and and that's that's how this industry is like it's a constant game of telephone where the where the facts keep changing and what you believed yesterday you're now completely against today (laughs) yeah but as your job get the spoon and get the biggest pot you can and start stirring baby i mean that's (laughs) that's it like that's what we want to hear well it's not only that speculate one of the things that we've talked about before is everyone keeps everything such a damn secret in this ind- industry. And I, I think it was like two or three years ago that I actually started talking about that stuff on the podcast. Like at first I was always afraid of walking on eggshells. Like, Oh, I'm not going to say it until they make their official release a week before big buck before they finally say who's on their team this year. But then like you start putting that stuff out. And I think that transparency kind of fuels the whole thing and it fuels that curiosity. And like you said, if a team is leave, losing a big name guy, they're also getting another guy coming in, and now you're going to get different fans that did not stop at your rig last year that are now going to come by your rig and check out your program because of your new rider. And so I feel like getting the stuff out for one, you can't take everything you hear with a grain of salt. Um, <laughs> there's there's especially one thing in particular that I'm talking about when I say this that I kind of want to say, but with you being a fellow XC1 competitor. We're not going to go down those rabbit holes because we can't reveal sources. But there's one of the things that I, I heard, and it's like, that that sounds 
like it could never happen, but it came from somebody that would know. And then I heard from somebody else completely unrelated that is also somebody that would know. And so that's the kind of way I go about the process. If I hear something, I don't, I don't ever talk on here something that I heard from one person. I kind of look into it, ask a few different people, get a few different sides. And then if it checks out, I say it. But then two weeks ago on the show, we talked about some of that stuff. And all of a sudden I get DMs telling me I'm wrong. And here's what's going on <laughs> from people involved. So it, it's one of those things that even if you, you go through your, your due diligence and it, it sounds legit, it's not always legit. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with that. Like there's, and, and a lot of times you'll hear something like, Hey, so-and-so is talking to this team. And then you hear a week later, so-and-so signed with this other team. It's not necessarily that they weren't talking and maybe they were in the final stages of making this deal and, something else got shook up another rider left this team and that that team now has a free budget and the next guy is this guy that almost had a signed deal and now he's leaving going somewhere else and and that situation happened this year um or this silly season a couple weeks ago i mean there's there's been a lot of a lot of little shifts and and one shift kind of you know the butterfly effect has changed the whole industry just one one big change changed the entire xc1 lineup i I think or or, or a lot of it um and you know that that stuff like it's good that it happened um you know i i think that i think that little things like that are gonna kind of spark the the rider salaries again and and it, it put it put teams to where they actually had to bid for these riders and guys started making good money this year like the guys were i mean i i heard i heard for an XC2 rider, a, a, an absurd amount of money for an XC2 rider, and that just got done this year. That 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 just got signed recently. That's and, what I'm talking about. And and that is that is what I want to hear. Like I hear that stuff, and I'm like, hell yeah! Like that's what the industry needs. That is what we want. That's what we want to see. That's what we want to hear. And I mean, a guy a, a guy in XC2 is going to be making more than eighty percent of the XC1 riders next year. And that's good. That's what I want to hear. Like stuff like that fires me up, even though I know I'm kind of on the, on my way out, you know, in my later parts of my career, but, but still you're 27 years old. What's that? I said, you're 27 years old. I I know, but (laughs) I'm getting, I'm getting up there. I've had too many injuries, but you know, with with me kind of, shifting on my way out like i'm i'm hoping that it'll it'll the the future of the sport will be a little bit brighter i mean there's a lot of trackable sales to the off-road there's a lot there's a lot more sales than what we're getting paid for um and yeah i know there's a it takes an army to do what what it what it does and there's a lot of money dispersed but do we need do we really need two semis at a race like um you know let's let's figure out a way to cut some budgets pay some damn riders let's get some results and and pay these boys what they're worth because i can tell you one thing it's not anybody else's neck that breaks when i hit that damn tree i can promise that it's not there it's nobody else's neck it is literally no skin off their back for anybody else involved so when you think about it like that and you think about how short-lived a, a rider's career is and the fact that most of these kids that make it professionally had to skip school to get there, like $40,000 deals. Sorry. I, I would, I, I, I've never taken one. I mean, I, I, I've never taken one ever. And, and that's fact. Like my worst years in XC one, I would not take that. Cause again, it's not their neck. So when, when you're looking at numbers like that, like, um, I'm, I, I, I like to see these guys, these XC2 kids that are, that are making these big monies or <laughs> big, the, making this big money, <laughs> big these monies. big monies, these big monies. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I like to hear about these XC2 kids that are making big money because now they're going to go into the XC1 class and somebody's going to try to offer them 50 grand. And they're like, Oh, hell no. I was making 90 last year. Sorry about that. Um, and, you know, I feel like once you're an XC1, like, you should be making money like that. Plus, and, and you know, yeah, it, it, it's still, it's not enough money. Like, what, what you know, 90 grand still not enough. But at the end of the day, it's a step in the right direction. Um, 
because in the past there's been a lot of forty thousand dollar XC one deals, a lot of forties and fifties, and and to me that's you know when you're at the you're at the pinnacle of your sport. I mean, this is the largest off road series in the world. That is that is honestly peanuts. Like I'm sorry, but that is not worth it. And I I know there's people that are going to see on the flip side and say, oh well, you know, this guy sounds arrogant. You know, he should be happy to have a job. Bitch, come pay my bills on forty thousand dollars. <laughs> I want you to drive the entire country, live in Florida for a few months, train, do all the nutrition side of things. I want you to do every single bit of it off of forty grand. And then come back and tell me that I should be appreciative for that. Sorry, not sorry. Not happening. Um so the fact that a little more money's coming in, a little bit of uh a little bit of a little bit of teamwork with the riders, a little, a, a little bit of not necessarily teamwork, but guys actually discussing things behind behind closed doors. Like that's the, I, it was it was cool to see. That's the biggest thing. That's what needs to happen is people need to stop. And it's easy for me to say this. I'm not directly involved in the middle of it, and I'm not getting paid to ride a dirt bike. But I think the transparency, if even if it's not to the public yet, like NFL contracts the public knows the details of the contract before the player knows. But even if, if it's not going to go that far, like at least hopefully some of the stuff that we've talked about, we've, we've beat over the top of the head over the, over these podcasts over the past year, hopefully some of that at least resonates and people are talking amongst themselves. Like, Hey, I was talking to so-and-so they offered me this. Oh, I was talking to so-and-so and they offered me this. So hopefully they can use that information against each other to drive the market up as a whole because like you said a rising tide raises all ships and when you start talking about forty thousand dollars for a contract a brand new ktm 350 is eleven thousand one hundred ninety nine dollars you can only buy three motorcycles so that means if you're paying someone forty thousand dollars and because someone watched them win a race on that bike on a sunday three bikes get sold all year that's that rider's salary we need to be going above and beyond that and yeah. um, I, I hope that this is the the sign of a, a tide change. And I hope that I know a lot of riders do listen to this. And like I said, it, it's really easy to stand on a high horse and sit here and talk about it behind a microphone. But that's that's the biggest thing is just everyone kind of working together to at least drive the whole market up there. There's room for more money. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and if you take, you know, it, all it takes is one guy take it too little and and I've heard a lot about West Coast racing here lately. Uh, I've been talking to some guys, and apparently in the West Coast, some some very high ranked riders have taken some very low salaries. And I've, it has I've heard some disturbing screwed. stuff about the West Coast stuff here lately. Yeah, and and it, well, it act you know with with what's going on, it's absolutely screwed everybody else over there. So nobody can make money, and the cost of living's triple what it is here. So yeah. these guys are literally signing like top riders for forty, thirty, or forty thousand dollars on the West Coast right now, and these are some of the best riders in the world, and that's what they have to live off of in California. And I'm sorry, but thirty or forty thousand dollars when it, when it costs forty five dollars to go to a practice track out there. Oh, and by the way, people don't have private land out there. Like you're not going to your buddy's backyard track. Like you're usually going to a riding park. Um, that like it's unfeasible. It's it's unfeasible. So I don't understand like that side of it. But I don't. I doubt that any of the riders are working together out there. And and it's easy to screw themselves. And that's why I hired an agent this year. Um, you know, I I talked about it. I said I was going to do it, and I followed through with it. And you know, it was it was cool to see. Like, obviously, I went to Loretta's and spent spent some time there, and I was sitting around, and a couple of agents were actually talking to each other, and uh, and it was cool to see that the agents are working. Obviously, they get paid a percentage off of what the riders making, so they want to work together, and and they want all the money. How, yeah, like let's let's figure out how how we can make this guy more money. Um, and, and it's not that they're working against the team because at the same time, they, the agent shares responsibilities with the team. You know, the agent is signing a contract with the rider, but also with the team, um, with their negotiations that they have to keep their rider doing certain things, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, basically they're a full representative of the rider. Um, and, and on the flip side, the team, if they have an issue, they can tell the agent like, Hey, this is what we got to do with your rider, whatever it may be. 
So they play, they walk a, they walk a tight line there and play a pretty cool role um, to where they're working for the rider, working for the team, but kind of know everything what's going on. You know, this guy's making, this guy over here is making this and he won this, this and this, and he got this many podiums this year. Um, he's got this many followers, whatever it may be. Like he's worth this. Um, this other, this other guy, he's this, this, and this, like he's, he's worth it. He's worth the same or he's worth more, whatever. Like they, they have it down to where they're, they're working to, to make sure that it's worth it. Um, and they know, they know what's reasonable. The only problem right now that I'm having, like, um, you know, with, with the agent basically being the only guy with an agent here is he he's new to everything so like he's doing he's he's definitely in tight with the industry um and he's definitely doing a lot to help but like he's new here so so he doesn't know every single rider's salary what are they making so like every time i hear another guy sign like i'm telling him like hey this is what so-and-so signed for um and sooner or later like that's gonna help the entire industry and I'm hoping that other off-road riders are going to start reaching out to agents and, and having some type of outside representation, not only for that side, but also the legal side. So that things don't happen like what happened to me in the past. Um, you know, they, most agents are going to be backed by an attorney. So you sign on with them. Yeah. They're, they're taking 10% of your money, but at the same time, you're also, you're also protected legally. Um, they're going to go to bat for you on your contract unless you do something horribly wrong. So, um, you know, that those little things, those little changes, I think are definitely going to help the industry. It's probably going to piss off some of the team managers, but I think once everybody learns to work with it, instead of getting upset with it, um, it, it'll start helping out because it's, it's easy to, it's easy for a team manager to talk down to a rider and it's easy for a rider to handle things with emotion with their team manager. Um, but, I mean, I, I don't want to cut you off, but right there, the team manager should be the rider's number one advocate. The team, the the rider getting paid 20 grand more or 10 grand less, that's not going to affect the team manager's paycheck. Like, the team manager should be the one also going to bat for these riders and being like, hey, man, you're really going to give him a contract for $40,000 when he did this, this, and this last year? He placed this in this series and this in this series? Come on, let, let, let's give him 70. Let's give him 75. Like, the team manager should be the number one advocate. And that could be their number one negotiating tool. I mean, if you got a guy that's struggling for top tens and you can go after a guy that's top five week in and week out, you, I mean, just like the way that every other thing in this world works, you should be able to go like the team manager should be able to go get those riders. And what at the end of the day drives everybody with the motivation for doing this is money. It's a job. It is fun. And there's a lot of fun to be had and it's a good way to make a living, but everyone goes to work to get paid. And I think the team managers could be the biggest advocate for the riders because they are the sole person that is in the middle. Right now, they are the only ones that's in between the manufacturers and the riders. They're that line of communication. Yeah, I mean, to an extent, a lot of the team managers, at least with us, are also team owners. And and that means that they're they are trying to collect money from, let's say, Moose and Parts Unlimited and CD and, and – helmet companies oh, and parts yeah. companies and, and so for them like the less their they budget out, the is only going to go so far so so they're going to have to they're going to have to come out with x amount of money that goes to the rider i mean it it yes the factories definitely push um and the factory can do more behind to make sure that the riders getting everything they need financially etc but a lot of these guys are the team managers are, are also paid by these extra deals. So if they give the rider a hundred grand and they've only got 20, well, now they screw themselves. So, um, you know, that side of it's tough as well. And, um, I think, you know, even some of these teams, I, I feel like a lot of these teams should start working with some type of agent as well to start helping their deals come together. I mean, on motocross and supercross, they, they do have representation for the teams as well. And, you know, I, like I said, I, I may be I may be in left field, but I uh, um I think that some of this stuff is going to start paying off, and um at, at one at some point I'll hopefully be running a team. Um, you know, when I when 
when I get when I get older, like that's that's kind of the 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 future plan. Like I would love to run a team and 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 be that guy that's trying to go to bat for the riders. But um, you know, I I want I want to carry a, a manager until I'm in that position, and hopefully when I if I ever get to that position, we can make a lot of money. My riders can make a lot of money. I can make a lot of <laughs> money, and hopefully we're all doing well. But um, you know, it's it, it's going to take some work and. I'm just trying to get it off the ground now, and I think that uh, I, I'm hoping I'm hoping that that getting management to these riders and or teams is is going to help the entire industry on the off road side of things. Yeah, and to, to play devil's advocate of that too, you you look at a a kid that works their way up through the ranks that bust their butt, their mom and dad dropping all this money into it. They start dropping all this money into it. They're spending money to go race eat week in and week out. They're buying bikes, they're buying parts, they're replacing motors, they're doing all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, someone comes to them and says, "Hey, we're going to give you forty grand, and we're going to pay for you to get to the races. We're going to give you all the bikes and all the parts that you need, so you don't have to buy any of that stuff. You don't have to worry about it anymore." And then I, I think that's what, what changes them. Like, you mean to tell me all of my expenses for racing will go away and I get paid on top of it? Which, that, that is a, a tough one to, to go after because, I mean, that is everyone's dream to be able to do this stuff and get paid to do it. So, I don't know. It, yeah, there is I mean, the, obvious... the thing that I see, like, it's not, about the, it's not about the kids taking the cheap rides. It's more about the XC1 riders, XC1 and top XC2, like, when you get to the top, like that's where, that's where it's like, okay, we, we got to do that. Like we got to do it right. We need to, we need to make sure that we're doing it right. You know, we all had to take, we all had to take what we could get coming through the ranks. And, and, you know, I mean, how a lot of times it starts off with a hook, a deal getting 15% off before you know it, you know, that company might be paying you 15 grand five years later. But, um, yeah, it's, it's more like direction, towards like the guys that are on these factory teams that i'm you know more or less talking about not not the first kid getting his first good ride it's mm-hmm. it, you know <clears throat> granted there's kids that are worth money like to me grant davis is worth money like that kid's that kid's going somewhere <clears throat> um jojo cunningham he's worth money to me um you know a couple of these kids that are coming through like like they're they're worth money they're worth money early on because I know that they're going to be somewhere. Like, they're going to go somewhere. Man, so, look at old Brody Joe Hansen. I think of him as being, like, a, like, like older a older than his years. I don't think of him as being 17 years old. He's kind of like a Jordan Ashburn. He flies under their radar. Yeah. He but just, you know, he's, he's there, he's consistent, he's fast, but you don't hear his name a lot. No, I mean, look at what he did the year before last in in the amateur ranks, and now obviously he's he's running XC three. But I think put him on two fifty F full time next year, and he goes XC two next year. I think he's going to be a guy to look out for. But you start talking about JoJo and the the Grant Davises, and um, now you got Nick DeFeo who's going to be moving up. You got um, like all these young guns that are absolutely crushing it. Uh, Cole Forbes is another one like it's cool to see that wave of talent coming up and see which one of those guys are going to be the next guys you know what i mean yeah yeah definitely and you know it, it's definitely like i have my opinions but it, it can always change like um right now i don't see the the overwhelming talent pool that there used to be um of guys that are just that just have the full package like there's a lot of fast kids, but a lot of the kids are just too damn soft to make it, to, to really make it. Like, <clears throat> I'm looking, I'm looking at the kids with the grit. Like, I'm looking at the one that's gonna, that's gonna get going. Because to be the best, you have, you have to have that in you. And uh, a lot of these kids just they, from what I see, like they don't have that grit of, of the kids that were coming out, you know, year after year after year, two at a time every year there was two kids that came out of the youth class every single year for probably seven years that you could say they're going to XC one. And they did like, yeah, some were, some had shorter careers due to injuries. Some, some, some got with crazy women. Some had family drama, stopped racing. Like there's, there's other things that happened, but like there was two at a time that made it to XC one and went straight to the top. 
and and were able to compete top ten overall three and three to five years after coming out of the youth ranks. And you don't see that anymore. Like that doesn't quite happen like it like it was for a long time. So now it's like you're really questioning like who is it really going to be? And you know, I, I got my opinions on who the, who the next ones are going to be, but um, it's tough to say. Like they're uh, you got to find those tough kids. Like um, you got to find you got to find that full package, and and it, it's you don't really pick them out at thirteen anymore. You kind of wait till they're like fifteen and in the A class, and you're like, uh, okay, let's watch him in a mud race. Is this kid actually tough, or is he going to quit? And you know, that's where that's that's kind of at least what I what I see with the with the kind of up and coming kids versus a few years ago. Like you, you knew you knew that kid is tough at twelve years old. You're like that 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 little shit there eats nails for breakfast. Like he's going to make it. But, um, you know, it, it's it, like I said, I, it's not quite like that from what I can see in the youth ranks has been and up in the early amateur ranks anymore, but it's still fun to watch and, and fun to guess on who that next kid will be. Um, let me, let me ask you this. Let me get your opinion on obviously with this sport as any individual sport, you got to have that grit. Like you said, you got to have that mentality. You have to want it for yourself. If you don't want it as bad as somebody else wants it for you, you're not going to be successful. And there's really no other way around it. But what I want your opinion on is being as involved in racing as I've been and being behind the scenes of at one point or another, every major series on the East coast, one thing that I've seen is the way that parents interact with their kids. And you have parents that are supportive. You have parents that kind of sit back and they're just there. And then you have the typical mini dads that go above and beyond that are way too strict, that are basically compensating for all the goals that they failed in life and projecting that onto their children. Do you think that, takes away grit or do you think that can make a kid harder because i think i think it go both ways but i think if you take a kid and let them build confidence in themselves and let them work on that and let them learn those things by themselves i think they have the potential to learn and grow from that but i think if you force it down their throat and you take a kid that already had a bad day they're gonna they're gonna obviously be upset by it but then you just sit there and harp on it and ground them and make them ride in silence on the way home i feel like that's just gonna burn a kid out and break a kid down and do the opposite of what you think it's doing so i mean what what's your opinion on that line uh, I, and how does that relate to like your upbringing i could get deep into this um so to to, to cut us out of an hour conversation on this <laughs> obviously at the shoals i train a lot of kids um every kid's different so you have to find what that kid does well and and also who can make that kid perform well. Um, if somebody else fusses at my little cousin Caleb, he shuts down. I can smack him in the side of the helmet and tell him to get his shit together, and that kid will rip. I mean, yeah. like absolutely the fastest kid i told him the other day i was like why are you not why are you not overall in gncc's i mean the kid flies i had to fuss at him the other day and and i just i i i i was just like fussing at him hard on him because i know i know he performs better when i do that other kids would shut down and cry um and he would shut down and cry for somebody else so it's tough. Everybody's so different. Like some kids got to have that positive feedback. Like they, they don't, they, they don't feed well on it. My brother had needed thought positive feedback. Me, I want you to be blunt. Just like I talked about with my mechanic earlier, like be blunt to me. Hey, dumbass, what are you doing? Like, that's what I want to hear. At, 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 even at my spot where I'm a professional, like that's what I want to hear. Like, like tell me I'm being an idiot. Tell me I'm not doing it right and tell me what I need to do differently. And I might argue with you, but I, I damn sure will try your way. Um, and there's, like I said, there's just so many different types of people. When I was a kid, um, 
I want I wanted to get smacked in the back of the helmet before I took off on the starting line. My dad would smack me in the back of the helmet when they waved ten seconds. And when I left the pit stop, my dad would smack me in the back of the helmet, <laughs> keep me fired up. And and I rode well. I'm about to well light you stop. up at the next GNCC. Yeah. So <laughs> um yellow jackets get on me, you know damn well I'm hauling ass. Um <laughs> But, no, like, everybody performs so much differently when it comes to that. It's, it's hard to say. I think that um, from what I see, kids with discipline from their parents do the best. And not necessarily that they're out there being many dads, but kids who, kids who know the word no. Kids who know what it's like to have to work for something kids who whose parents may have plenty of money but still call still make their kids work a summer job to go racing or whatever it may be like they have a they have a a a stern upbringing um not the parents that just kind of sit back and let it happen like those kids are usually pretty soft um with that being said there are kids who just have that extra grit and they'll do it themselves whether their parents are there or not like there's 14, 13 year old kids that you'll see that are like there, they're they're there for it. Like their parents may sit in the camper all day long, but those kids are working harder than anybody else. And and their parents may be very distant in their racing deal. It may be something that their grandparents got them into, or their buddy got them into, and now they're fast and now they're 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 wanting to go training. But their parents are just you know they're supporting it and they're there, but they don't know anything about it, so they stay back. And then you've got the the you did it, Jimmy. Parents, those are the worst. Um, and I know this is probably going to cancel me because that's the whole thing now, cancel culture. Um, so this might oh, cancel me for saying oh, this, oh, but oh. <laughs> everybody, everybody talks about um, switching how, genders. Oh, sorry. What's that? Nothing. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> everybody talks about how how oh you've got to be positive to children you know you can't no bullying no po- all positivity it's all sunshine and rainbows well let me tell you what you don't get to be the best by thinking that everything's sun- that sunshine and rainbows because someday one day life is going to kick you and it's going to kick you right in the teeth and it's going to blow your face apart and it's going to break your neck And it's going to put you through hell and back. And if you want to be the best, you have to know that. And sunshine and rainbows, good job, Jimmy, ain't going to cut it. So when good job, Jimmy, parents come down to my track and they're pumped up on their kid, good job, Jimmy, will never make it. Sorry. So that's my, that's my opinion. Um, I've seen a lot of kids. I've seen a lot of fast kids. I've, I've raced, I've grown up racing. I've seen their seen inside their 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 family lives and you know the guys that the guys that made it the the guys that that wanted it the guys that made it to the top and yes like i said maybe they're not all here but but like the kids that came up in my generation that came up with grit nick davis and and zach nolan and ryan lojack and all the kids that i grew up racing with lane michaels like all these kids none of their parents were good job jimmies their dads would come in after a race, and if you sucked, it was going to be a long damn ride home. I promise. <laughs> and and you just kept your mouth shut. And if you said anything, your dad was going to tear into you. I so think you just, I think there's a, your your there's a difference. There's a difference in that though between <laughs> you suck, you didn't win, or you didn't try. You know what I mean? Like if a kid tries his hardest, and everyone else in that house are just, or everyone else in that class are also just killers. And you get fourth place, but the three in front of you are really good riders. Like that, that's not something to be angry about. Like it's a, it's a coachable moment, but I don't know. So what started this whole thing is I feel like I've accomplished a a good bit of high level athletic stuff. Like I won a wrestling state championship. Neither of my parents were even there. Uh, I've won pro skateboard contests. Neither one of my parents were there. I don't even think either one of my parents could tell you the name of my podcast. And I've been doing it for five years. This is what I do. Um, but that being said, like I, I go through those times where like, man, if I had that support, maybe I could have damn taken over the world by now if I accomplished this with nothing. But then I look at some of these mini dads and the way that 
they treat their kid after a race and the way that they react to a kid having a bad test and the way that they react to a kid um, forgetting their gloves at the house, like something like that. And it kind of flips me back to, well, I would have rather had what I had than to have that and have that much pressure and have all of that being projected onto you at such a young age. So I, I don't know. There, there's like a, a I, like fine I said, line. I, I think a lot of that is, is, is person by person. I mean, that's completely individual. Like yeah. you have to know what kid you're working with. Like, you know, that's the biggest thing. Grant and I brothers, same dad, same mom, completely different people. If, if you fuss at Grant, he's not going to ride well. Grant Grant's not going to take it well. You fuss at me, you better watch out the next test yeah, or I'll show next you. race or first lap, whatever it may be. Like, I want to get pissed off. And when I get pissed off, when I get bad starts, like, look at any of my worst starts from the last couple of years. My worst starts are my best races. Like, it pisses me off. When I got to go through that pack and one by, one guy might not let me around and I got I to gotta trade paint with him to get by, that's all it takes. And 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 we just ignited. Like, so, you know, everybody's very different as far as that goes. And, and I think that's a lot, a lot to do with just person by person. But the parents can definitely find out, you know, what works with this kid and what doesn't. And, you know, that, that side of things that uh that obviously can can make or break a career um if you know your rider and 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 like you know it goes all the way to the pro ranks like it goes all the way to literally what we discussed earlier with teams and what teams would be better for different riders ben kelly i'm sure his parents did something different than my parents did because he's a different he's a different kid or he i'm sure was a different kid growing up so I'm sure they didn't handle things the same way that, that my parents did, which is also probably why he rock, likes to ride for a different style of team than I would like to ride for. Um, so, you know, it, it literally, like I said, goes all the way to the pro ranks and and you mesh with certain people, certain riders mesh with certain teams. And I'd say a lot of it goes back to just the way that they are all the way from kids. And you just got to figure out, like, as a parent or as a trainer, you got to figure out how to make that mesh start. And it's tough, like, especially, you know, doing what I do, like I got to fuss at one kid and be nice to the next kid. But a lot of times while I'm fussing at this one, the other one's already scared. He's like, Oh my God, anything he says is already mean. Like, or, or if I'm too nice to the rest of the group, then Caleb gets nothing from it. Um, and you know, it's, it, it's like, everybody has their their little niche and um every rider is so different or athlete you know person um as far as what how to get performance out of them but you know i i definitely see like i i see i see a lot of that and you know even even little things like certain things will throw my race off where it may not throw the next guy's race off and you know vice versa yeah, and and like you said, that's a that's a whole other can of worms that can be dove into for an hour. But yeah, just a just an observation that that I was wondering about. But uh, oh hey, by the way, now that we're uh, fifty three minutes and twenty nine seconds into this, um, there was a race this weekend. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping you just bypassed that completely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, I just was I only just one. want to talk about. Uh, section five. That's that's the only part we need to talk oh, about. Perfect. I can talk about section five all day. So <laughs> section five. So we get to start off with the good. Perfect. Um, <laughs> no, so, so from the start, it was it was rough. I uh, I I had heard it was uh, dusty. What's that? I heard it was pretty dusty out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, so Ohio, being Ohio we got rain right before the race. Um, it made the track extremely slippery. I got, um, it, Enduros are tough. You might have like true beginners starting in front of you when you're passing at our speed to true beginner and slick conditions, things can sometimes get sideways. Um, so in test one, I, I had an issue with, uh, I hit a lap or got tangled up and then, um, 
after that, these two guys kind of came together in a ditch. I went out and around them, and when I was coming back on the trail, something kicked my back end into a tree, stopped me, threw me over the bars. Lost a lot of time in test one. Test two, blew the second turn, turning back around, come back in. One of the guys on the road slipped by, and then um, the next turn was slick as shit. I, I got into his bike, and we, our bikes got hung together, and I couldn't get off of him, and he couldn't get off of me. And um, I looked down at my watch when it was all said and done after blowing – blowing the first or second turn and, and stuck in the next one um we were probably 10 seconds into the test and when i got off of him i was i looked at my watch and we were 54 seconds in so i lost like 45 seconds right at the start of that test and then had another little tip over just trying to make up time and um you know between between incidents i was riding a winning race like i I always count, I, I've talked about it on here before, but I always count or watch my watch when I crash. Like, I want to know how much time did I give up? Because at the end of the test, if I know that I crashed twice and one of them was six, seven seconds and the next one was seven, all right, I've lost 13 seconds and I got beat by nine. Well, shit, I, I just ran a winning test. I threw that away. Um, so I want to know, like, what my performance is. Am I actually riding really good? And, and for the most part, I was riding phenomenal all day i just had a lot of setbacks and it was odd it was different than normal it's like i i told my mechanic i was like dude it's like when you're late for something and you're running through town and there's only four stoplights and every single one of them stops you and then the last one turns green but there's an ambulance coming and you gotta wait and and you pass your full cycle and you're still in red like that was what my day felt like. Like everything was going smooth, and I did, I would hit a stoplight that just it 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 was it, it just prolonged the process. And um, you know, I felt good. I was riding good. I was keeping my feet on the pegs. I was I was leaning under the bike. I was keeping my bike up and down. Like everything that I I worked on this week um, for this race in particular. We rode a very slick track all week long. Me and Matowski and some other guys. Um, all the things that I was wait that, that I was waiting to use, like I was using them. Like I, I was I was riding flawlessly, but the mistakes were a lot of times made with with another lap or trying to get off the track to to bypass. Um, I was getting a little further off the track than normal, so that I was steering way clear of the guys that I was passing, or at least I was hoping to. And then I, in test four, I believe I got stuck. On a, I, I hit a log off the track, went over the bars, bike landed on me. I'm stuck under the bike. It's against the log. Just a total shit show. And then test five, we are rolling up to it. And me, Craig DeLong, Bollinger, we're going through the transfer. And I see this lightning and Craig looks back at me and he starts shaking his head. And I mean, you can tell like the way we're headed is right into the storm. And I mean, there's bolts of lightning like crazy. We get down to the test, and two minutes before I take off, it absolutely downpours. And I mean, this is the hardest rain. This is the biggest, craziest storm. Like, they don't get crazier than this. I Like, we were in a damn hurricane. There was hail coming down. It was so dark that you could not see in the woods. Like, I, <laughs> like actually couldn't see. It was so dark. And I'm... I'm racing these first three miles and there's lightning bolts that I can see through the trees, which means they are close. Like as the bolt, as I see the bolt, I hear the thunder like, and it, I mean like bust your eardrums loud and national duros aren't like GNCCs. They're not deep rutted. So for there to be standing water on a hillside on a little tiny benched out track. And I swear it was like it literally just flowing water the entire way. Like it was coming down. Like I've never seen it rain and the, the lightning, like it would, your heart would skip every single time. And I don't know why, but like it, I love, I love getting scared. Like I, the, I, there's just something <laughs> about that feeling like that, that feeling of, of helplessness, terrified, but pushing through it. Like, that feeling is the most, I, I, I don't know how to describe it. So like I'm out there what? like two miles in and all this shit's going on. And I'm like, you know what? I'm the toughest son of a bitch out here. And that's the, that's the mindset I got to have, whether I am or not, it doesn't matter, but that's the mindset I got to have. So I'm like, I'm, I'm going to win this damn test. And all I could think of is like the guys in the early XC two rows, it didn't start raining on them for like a few miles in. So I'm like, 
Brody Johnson is probably going to beat me. And then halfway through, I'm like, I'm rolling. Like, I'm going as fast as if it weren't raining. Like, <laughs> I'm hauling ass. Like, Brody ain't going to beat me. And and I'm just like, I, I'm getting pumped up in it. Like, the track was, it, it was so much fun. Like, I had a blast that last test. I mean, the hail, the hail coming down, the rivers coming down the track, the lightning, the 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 terrified like panics when the lightning bolts when you could see them like all that it made for a really fun last test and i don't know why like i knew i won that test nobody had the times i didn't care i knew i won that test i came in (laughs) i came in and melissa was asking me how it was and i was like that was the most fun shit i've ever ridden like flat out it was awesome so um yeah, the, that test was great, but pretty much everything else was uh, really, really bad for me. I just had, like, I was riding good between. It's just, like I said, major setbacks when they happen. The guy on my row had a helmet cam on. If he's listening, I hope he sends me some of the footage of me under my bike, on my bike, sideways, <laughs> off the track, whatever. Like, he, he, he was probably getting upset waiting for me to pick my shit up every test. Like, it was it was pretty rough. But, um, yeah, it was it was a rough day, but... It, it, it's part of it points wise that sucks like grant's too good in these last four rounds like um with him having 22 points now i mean you're looking at alabama and indiana some of the te- some of the races where the guy's damn near unstoppable um <clears throat> you know races like that are gonna be tough to to put any points obviously anything can happen bad luck can happen i gotta i've gotta be there waiting if he has a bad day but um you know fourth places like this weekend that that can't happen anymore i mean i i couldn't tell you the last time i've missed a national enduro podium when i'm healthy like i've had a couple where i've missed it but due to injury and aside from that like it's been years of of a a pretty consistent podium streak there at the enduros so i think i actually went over a year a year and a half without missing one completely so um to miss a podium was pretty pretty upsetting for me so it, it is what it is we'll uh we'll be back and ready for the next one but can't have that happen again yeah i mean just four seconds off uh trevor bollinger gets a, a podium which is i mean i don't trevor's not usually a national enduro podium guy um but he ends up in in third place and then toth was only one second back in in fifth place but um, heading into the weekend, it, it was Ryder. So you gained a couple points on, on Ryder, but like you said, I'm sure that you were hoping for a lot more than that. Yeah. And, and, and not to lose as much from Grant. That was the, that was the big one, you know, to the, the 12 points to Grant. That's a, that's painful there. So, um, you know, putting me, I believe 22 down from him. So 22 points, four races left and two of them being his favorite tracks. That's going to be tough, but, um, you know, I've been in this position before, and um, I'm not as young and dumb as I used to be. I don't know that I'll hang it out quite like I used to, but I can still go fast when I need to. So um, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll see. He might have won. He might have won these races more, but I've I've won more championships. <laughs> there you go. Make sure you remind him of that. Oh yeah, he knows. Man, so one little quick thing. Um, speaking of Grant, our new National Enduro Points leader. Uh, and speaking of silly season, I saw Babbitt's Cowie post a uh, Kawasaki 450 that had Bark Busters on it, and I haven't seen any Australians run Bark Busters, so that's interesting. Um, are you gonna race the last four GNCCs? Yes, yes, I'll do the last four, and still, uh, still just not a hundred percent. I mean, I, I'm coming back slower from this than than I have from any other setback. I think just you know with the with the neck thing like i was so down for so long like i know i'm not 100 percent where i need to be um like I've physically still, or still dealing with pain from it um motion and 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 physically um so like my i i lost some motion and a lot of flexibility a lot like um everywhere i was to to be to be a fat kid I'm pretty damn flexible and uh <laughs> yeah I lost a lot of a lot of motion and and a lot of strength and um you know I, I I've always been able to keep like 
doing something when I've been injured. This one, like, I wasn't able to do anything, and I didn't realize how fast I'd lose it. And, you know, uh, getting a little bit older, you don't bounce back as fast. Like, every year it comes back slower. And um, Having multiple traumas didn't make things any easier. So definitely been definitely been difficult to come back from this one um, more than anything else. Like, I just feel like I completely lost my base, and I've never had that feeling before. So um, trying, to, trying to rebuild that, you know, through the summer, and I'm sure I'm going to have to do a lot of work this offseason to get back to where I need to be. And, where I was last year, but, um, you know, I'm definitely ready, ready for it. Um, I just want to get back out in the GNCCs and see, see where I stand again. Um, and what I've got to work on this off season. So that's, uh, <clears throat> that's the big part is, is just getting out there and doing it. And I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to get on that. Um, you know, the, the counting down the days at this point, I, looking forward to to Beckley. I mean, that's one of my favorite races and I've always done really well there. That is an awesome racetrack. I like yeah, that they uh, uh I like that they added I, mean, I think we've run it three years or maybe I was injured for it. I've run it three years. Two or three. And, yeah, so the first year I led all the way until a mile from the finish. The second year I won it and the third year I won it. So um we're we, it's definitely a track that suits my style and I'm, I'm looking forward to that one and hopefully we can it would be cool to come back to the GNC season and get a win and, um, you know obviously that's always the goal whether it's realistic or not I don't know but um, you know that's that's what I'm hoping for at this point sweet good deal can't wait to, can't wait to see the rest of the season uh, I guess we go back in GNCC racing in three weeks yep yep three weeks next week We'll be watching Team USA at the ISDE. Um, and then after that, we go back to GNCC racing. But, um, man, thanks for your time. Thanks for coming on. It was a, a good conversation and good catching up with you. And um, I guess we'll see you around. All right. Awesome. Sounds good. I'll talk to you soon. All right. See you.